This is the Powered Up Podcast, show 124. I feel your pain and I am in total agreement because the conversation does end there, right? It's like, oh man, like our, our scores are our scores are not what we want them to be. How do we improve it? Instruction. That's the answer. And it, like, we have to improve instruction. It is the singular greatest need that exists in our schools right now. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Ken Erman, host of the Power to Podcast, and I am here with my co-host, Mr. Matt, the help desk ticket, Rogers. Matt, how you doing tonight? Oh, dude, <laughs> not very kind. It took me a moment to get it. If you watch the episodes either on Spotify or YouTube, so you can see our ugly faces, you know, our ugly myths, uh, my video cut out wildly you know, 10, 15 minutes into the episode. So everyone's just guessing what I'm going to say. So I had to shut my computer down afterwards, but here we are. You can see me for a few more minutes and then I'll disappear as we get into the interview. Yeah. Uh, and Matt, tonight we had one of our by far best guests, no offense to all of our guests, all of our guests are amazing, but just a, a a person in education that if you follow, if you go to conferences, if you see keynote speakers, if you follow you know, some of our influencers on social media, Weston Kieschnick is is one of the top people to follow who I've been following for years. And it's not because he's popular. It's because he gets it. He understands teaching. He understands instruction. And he now twice has, I think, been at the forefront of the conversation that has needed to happen. His his ideas in 2018, 2019 on how and why we integrate instructional technology was right in line with what I think teaching needed. And now he's he's right in line with, with what we need now. And it's good, sound pedagogy and good, sound instructional practices to get the most out of our classrooms for the benefit of our students. I think the hard part, the, the real skill in his message is taking so much of well, I don't know if you feel this way, Ken, but pedagogy sounds like general common knowledge. It sounds like things that you should already know. So when you hear it, you don't take a moment to internalize it and say, this is substantial. You just say, oh, I already do that. I, I give myself that that grace to say it's already done. And through this conversation, the the point that was driven throughout the conversation was that needs to be emphasized more even though it seems general even though it sounds sounds obvious that needs to be a reminder and at the forefront of the decisions you're making and the the point of view that you're bringing to your classroom and planning and prep and the methodology that you choose to pull instruction and and mastery of learning out of kids it it was to say a whole lot of things that you've heard before, but in a clean, concise way, in a way that we need to hear it, I thought it was an awesome episode. And deep and rich. I totally. mean, it's there's there's no fluff to this conversation whatsoever. And and the message he offers, it's as teachers and and my, I myself, I am evaluating and reflecting myself on on what I need to do better, not only as a classroom teacher but as an instructional coach. And, and I think Weston really gets us to think about that and to realize that, yes, pedagogy and instructional strategies are important, but we have to take it serious and we need to, we need to know them and use them and be masters of teaching. We are, we are professionals and we need to treat ourselves like professionals and we need to act like professionals and we need to educate ourselves 
as professionals to do the best that we can do in our classroom. And I, and I think that's what I, what I loved about it, but he, per, he presents it in a safe, in a inspirational and in an affirming way to say, we can do it and, and we know how to do it. We might just need to uh, change our focus a little bit or change our perspective or yes, I know that instructional practice, but do I really know why it's effective? And when I realize why it's effective, I mean, might need to modify the way I do it to match, match what's supposed to happen to make it most effective. And I think those are the conversations that you hear in this show and the ideas you can get from him. So he talks about this at the end, but I just want to encourage everybody, go to his website, which are linked in the show notes description, as well as our website at poweredup.com. Follow him on social media. Check out both of his books, which you can just find right on his website, Bold School and, and Atlas. And so really check those out and, and walk away from this conversation. Please listen to it and take notes and think about it and reflect. This is coming out right at the beginning of summer. I think it's a perfect time that we have him as a guest, but also really look into the resources that he has out there in the world. His podcast that he has, Teaching Keating, his new one that he references coming out. Really use this, this individual as a valuable resource for yourself as you as you move forward into the new school year. Ken, so please. I think they're going to enjoy the vibe of this uh, episode, I'm just going to say. <laughs> nice, nice. So let's check in with uh, Teach Better Network. If this is the first time or you have not yet, please subscribe to our podcast. And then let's bring Weston Kieschnick right into the conversation. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Hi, Weston. Welcome to the Power to Podcast. How are you doing tonight? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. I am I'm very, very excited to have you here. I've been I've been following you for a long time. So to kick things off nice and simple for us, just please officially introduce yourself. Let our audience know where you are coming from and just give us a quick snapshot of your career in education. Yeah, I'm Weston Kieschnick coming to you from Denver, Colorado uh, during game one of the Western Conference Conference Finals. Go Nugs. Uh, yeah, so I am a uh, teacher, uh, uh, school administrator, uh, author of Bold School, Breaking Bold and the Educator's Atlas. Uh, and my um, uh, my genesis, the, the, like the origin story for me in this profession is like many of you is like, I sort of fell back asswards into a lot of things that I've done. Uh, I'll tell you when I started, I wanted to be two things. I wanted to be a high school history teacher and I wanted to coach football. And that was the sort of like the beginning, middle and end of what I wanted to do in education. And, uh, like a lot of people out there, I was sort of voluntold, uh, into an administrative, uh, spot and uh, was fortunate enough to have a principal once upon a time who believed in me enough to, you know, send me to a couple of conferences, bring me back. And then you all know, right? Like you go to a com couple of conferences, you come back and you present your new learning, you know? And unbeknownst to me, there was a uh, another principal from another school that she had invited in. This was my second year as a classroom teacher. And uh, that principal saw me do my 15 minutes at the staff meeting. And she was like, hey, would you mind doing that 15 minutes for our school down the road? I think that strategy might help our teachers. I said, sure, no problem. I went, did that 15 minutes. Unbeknownst to me, she in invited another teacher uh, or, or another principal who was like, hey, will you come to my school? Long story short, I end up doing that presentation about a half dozen times. And then all of those administrators get together and they're like, hey, we should just send this guy to conferences, split the bill and have him come back to present to all of us. Uh, my, pr my principal said like, Hey, what, what are your thoughts on that? And I was a second year teacher at the time. And I was like, I didn't have money to travel. I was like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Wasn't lost on me that this is a group of principals sort of like pimping me out for professional development. Uh, but it was a win-win as far as I was concerned. Like I would go to these conferences, come back and present. And that's how, sort of how I got started on the path, uh, of adult education and adult learning. Uh, and so I did that for a number of years and, uh, there was a point in time where I was, uh, I was teaching, working in a school and I kept seeing all these professional development folks come in and give us the message that like everything that we're doing is broken. The system is garbage. We need to change everything. And I remembered sitting there thinking like, well, damn, like, I know we need to get better, but I don't feel like everything we're doing is broken. 
You know, like I was like, I know that there's good things happening in my classroom. I know there's good things happening in lots of classrooms. And I didn't see where there was room for both of those things. Like, hey, how do we take what we've done that's great? And how do we sort of like integrate innovative ideas into that? And that's where Bold School came from. And that book just sort of like blew up beyond anything that I had expected. And now I find myself in this super weird job where I travel around and uh, speak to people and it's a it's a huge privilege that I should stand in front of a group of people and speak for any length of time and they should listen to anything that I have to say. So uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, thank you. And and I will say that I, f I first started following you back in, in 2019. I saw you present keynote at a, a conference I was at and I was really impressed with your message. And, and like you said, the simplicity of there are things that we do great and there are things that we can integrate in. And it was at a time when my district was a little bit behind in terms of technology integration. We weren't anywhere close to one-to-one -one when a lot of districts were moving in that direction. And I was always trying to get more technology into my classroom. And I kept saying to myself and to my administrators, I said, it's not just to like have these kids do things on screens, it's to accomplish things that we couldn't do without technology. And when I saw your presentation and read your book, it really, it really connected with me. And that book has a totally different meaning nowadays, you know, after going through the the whole pandemic, but I still but I still think it has the value the the core values of it have not changed at all. It's just everybody's perspective on technology it has changed. And so I'm seeing the pendulum go from everybody had to use it, kids were on devices constantly to now teachers are saying I want my kids off devices. I want screen time, you know, minimized and parents are saying the same thing and there's a lot of principles in there that I agree with, but I don't, I don't want the pendulum to swing so far. I feel like I was standing in the middle of saying, we can do this to be really creative and collaborative and innovative in our classroom. And the pendulum just went past and it went past again and everybody's missing that. So and it, with that and being said, like, happen, where, where do you weigh in on that? Yeah. Ken, it happens so fast, man. Right. Like, yeah. and, and the thing is like, I, like, I get it. I get it because <clears throat> and Ken, I'm curious to hear your perspective, right? So like, I actually do think one of the few benefits uh, that global pandemic brought us, uh, and again, I, I'm reluctant to even say that because it was such a traumatic experience in various ways, shapes and forms for so many people. Uh, but I do think one of the benefits is as a system, it forced education into a place technologically relative to innovation that it needed to be about five or 10 years earlier right? We were, we were late to the party in terms of technology and innovation. And COVID pushed us to a place that we needed to be in terms of uh, just accessibility for kids, in terms of one-to-one, -one, in terms of, you know, the access that kids had to not just devices, but things like reliable Wi-Fi in their schools. It was like that, that couldn't be optional anymore. And so I don't know, man, like, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I actually think that was one of the very few good things of COVID, yay or nay, from you guys. I, I agree. And, and Matt, I'll, I'll let you weigh in af after me. I, I totally agree. And I remember when I was doing professional development and, and presenting and, and working with teachers in my own district, as well as other districts, where I was trying to get them to think about some student-centered learning ideas and small group instruction. And I would, t I would introduce the idea of a screencast. Right. And it was a lot for teachers to digest this whole idea of recording videos and and having that in their classroom, the time it takes. Now it's that everybody knows how to do that. It's how do we leverage that to create collaborative learning in the classroom instead of just having everyone watch a video for 15 minutes and then do an activity. So totally. it's it's less of the how and more of the the why, I think, in, in how we're in integrating it into the classroom. Well, and I think part of that is it really rose the, the floor. It didn't necessarily cap the ceiling, but it brought that digital competency of who was working in a school to the level of, okay, you know, someone in Ken, your position as a tech coach right now, you have something to work with because everyone understands what Nearpod is. They may not have used it, but they can they can navigate. I mean, before it was, where's the power button and what what do I use to sign on? Like you had to have certain things figured out that once you were there, then it became a strategy from our end of how are we going to use it effectively? Because 
So with, with that idea of the digital competency raising to the point, you know, I think we all still feel, I'm a classroom teacher right now, I still feel fatigued by the use of technology like I did pre-pandemic because I was forcing things like the brand new cool tool that you got in your workshop that you knew you didn't need to use, but you just decided you're going to use it regardless, just because you had it, you loved it, you know, and, and you're going to overuse it. At least that's my, my view of things. Yeah, that, uh, you know, the word fatigue that you just used is 100% like, I, I have this unique perspective where I get to work with, you know, teachers and tech coaches and principals and superintendents from all around the country. And that fatigue is real right now. The fatigue is very, very real. I think, I think one of the things that COVID taught us is uh, the thing, one of the things that we value most is, is connectivity. Uh, and I mean, real connectivity, authentic connectivity, not just digital connectivity, but sort of like face to face, uh, authentic connectivity. And so I, I, I think, the fatigue that we're feeling is natural, it's normal. Uh, and at the same time, I also think, you know, Ken, you talked about this sort of like that pendulum really quickly swung all the way back. It went, it went from like, oh man, we're all like the floor is different for all of us to steal Matt's statement. And then now all of a sudden, like the floor is the same and we're all using technology all the time. And then we just like push that pendulum all the way back to the other side. Like, okay, now let's close these, put them back in the carts and not like use them again. It's like, okay, no, no, no. Like I get it. The fatigue is real, but I think we have to start taking honest looks at like, Hey, how are we using technology? And if technology doesn't serve to connect the student with the teacher, with the content and with one another, and all of those things have to be true. And if technology is not doing that, then it, this is not a technology problem. Uh, this is an implementation problem. And we have to ask like, hey, how are we implementing technology? Because again, if we take a look at what's going on in classrooms, like again, are students engaged with the teacher, with the content, with one another? The thing that's most frequently missing in that equation is kids engaged with one another. And I think that's why like, we saw the pendulum swing so hard back is like, oh, I just want the kids engaged with one another. And then we realized like, oh my gosh, that's super hard to do. Like to engage kids in classroom discussion, to manage kids who are uh, uh, you know, doing Socratic seminars, like even in some cases, like to get kids to to do a think pair share is really difficult. And so it's like, oh, man, I want to ditch technology. Oh, man, I'm having a hard time managing that. And then bang, we're back to kids in rows and working quietly. And that that can't be that can't be where we go back to. And so, you know, Ken, you asked me earlier, like, what's my stance on this? Like my stance is what it's always been. It's not about embracing a culture of or it's about embracing a culture of and we have to ask ourselves, like, where is there room for uh, really powerful instruction and innovative technology? And all of it needs to serve to connect the, uh, students with the teacher, the content and with one another. So if correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure you taught high school social studies. If I, if I, remember I did, correctly. man, I did. You have done your homework, my friend. Well done. If, I, I just remember your your uh, student teaching story, which was no. uh, <laughs> very entertaining. Uh, but a great but a great a great display of, of your message in that. So if you were to go back to teaching full time next year, yeah, in high school social studies, what is one of the most powerful things you've learned in your experience of writing, presenting, and and I would say most importantly, collaborating with teachers from all over the country, all over the world. Oh what my gosh. Would be, what would be something that was is a must have in your classroom that maybe was not a part of your classroom at all, or wasn't as important as you realized when you were in the classroom? Hands, uh, I love this question. This is a great question. Hands down, it is a robust knowledge of instructional strategies, what they are, what they're called, how to implement them, and their effect size, according to people like John Hattie's work. Uh, it was a, like when, when I think back on my time, I was like many teachers out there. Like I, I, I'm sure I uttered this phrase over and over. Like I would go sit in a, a professional development and be like, oh, I'm sort of doing something like that. I just didn't know what it was called. Like I am legit begging like teachers around the country, please, for the love, stop saying that to other people. Like it dilutes our professionalism at a time when we cannot afford it. That's our job. And so now like what I've learned and what I've seen is like, 
God, to be able to go back to my classroom and to implement a reciprocal teaching strategy where kids predict, clarify, question, and summarize, and to know that according to John Hattie's work, that has an effect size of seven tenths, and then to be able to execute on problem-solving teaching, where you model problems, give kids a problem to solve, allow them to engage in discussion about what they need to be able to solve the problem, then engage in productive struggle while I provide interventions. Like that's a five-step methodology for problem-solving teaching. Like to be able to do that, you know, to understand that things like feedback, like feedback, this is a word we use in education all the time, Feedback it doesn't have an effect size of seven tenths when the feedback flows from teacher to student about what we know and don't know. Feedback is most effective when we use all these tools out there, the cahoots and the quizlets and the mentimeters and the nearpods and the pear decks to solicit feedback from kids about what they know and don't know, and then use that feedback in the moment, not as an exit ticket when there's now no longer any time to act on it, like move that thing forward, you know? So like, when you're asking me like, oh, what is the thing I wish uh, like uh, that I know now that I wish I knew then? It's that like consider that your average classroom teacher knows about three or four instructional strategies that they can both name and describe with accuracy. Uh, I could run through about 36 of them right now that I could pull out of a back, my back pocket and implement. And that's such a huge, huge advantage because like as knowledge of instructional strategies expands, planning time contracts. And so like, that would be so much easier for me now. I, I, I can, I threaten at least once a month to my wife that I'm going to go do exactly what you just said. Like, I'm not going to get on another plane. I'm going to go walk back across the street to the high school. I'm going to go teach high school, coach football for the rest of my life and be abundantly happy. Just so you know, spoiler alert, I will do that one day. Like, I don't know if it's five years from now. I don't know if it's 10 years from now, but you will not see me on social media. You will not hear from me at a conference anymore because I will walk back into the classroom and teach and be abundantly happy. Quite, quite frankly, I can't wait for that day because it means I'm not in airports anymore. I could imagine that's a, a you know, one of those situations that from, from our point of view, being in the trenches right now, we feel like uh, the grass is always greener, but we're hearing more and more from like the opportunities of people similar to your shoes, that their heart obviously is clearly in one place. And you have a gift in this area that you are strong at navigating motivation for teachers, but in a directed way that actually makes a difference in classrooms, not just a rah-rah speech. And I think that's what we get excited about is when there's substance behind the message. If I can be uplifted, we all need this in this profession. There's no doubt that that's not a benefit, but when there's actually a step by step guidance or perspective of, you know, I've already set my first three items that I want to change when I go back. That is the true mark of what professional development needs to be. It's that pathway. And I think that's what we all strive for, whether it's me working with my grade level partner, Ken, you working with students or Weston, you having the chance to talk to small or large crowds. That's that impact that goes back and has an equal impact on kids. Matt, I'm so I'm so grateful for that, man. And honest to God, like that's legitimately like the the greatest compliment uh, I could hear from you or it, just anyone in our profession, quite frankly, because I like you know like Ken Ken brought up my student teaching story. Like I do, like I I love to tell stories. Like I love to hear people laugh. I love to motivate. But like the thing that keeps like the thing that keeps me getting on planes and going is the practitioner's work. It's the okay like. Because I, I like I would get no joy from this work at, at all if it was just exclusively about like being the rah rah guy and beating the like I have no I have I have no and I had no intention ever of being a motivational speaker. That is something I have zero and I mean zero interest in. Uh, what I have abundant interest in though is like okay, what's the nitty gritty? Like how do we get down to the business of actually moving the needle for kids? And in order to do that, like you have to speak the language of a practitioner. You have to know the work and you have to know kids. Otherwise, what are we doing? Otherwise, we just feel good for an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and then I'm out. And I just, I, 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 I can't, I can't sustain a career being that guy. So uh, I guess, it, yeah, I, I, just to challenge you, you know, I, I've heard so far some, like, I've loved where this conversation has gone, but I, I want to kind of, I don't know if this is a different answer. You said if. If you were to go back into the classroom, what you would bring to your classroom right now, 
I guess the challenge that I have is what do you see at, besides fatigue as the major emphasis or maybe the patterns of failure that your failure might be a strong word, but the, the patterns of challenge that you see on a frequent basis that needs to be more in the forefront of what we're actively working on. Is that in the same alignment with what you said you would bring to your own classroom or is there something else? It very, it very much is. The, I, I think the biggest challenge facing educators right now is a lack of pedagogical knowledge. It's a lack of knowledge about instructional strategies, right? I mean, I mean, think about it. Like, if I were to sit down with a group of teachers right now and be like, hey, right now, in the next 60 seconds, name 10 instructional strategies, go. Uh, you know what I would get? I would get a lot of tools right? And I would get a lot of sort of like, ooh, okay, uh, direct instruction, questions, feedback, and then stall. And so like, when I talk about bringing instructional strategies, and really specifically, like the ones that I love, it's, it's because I think that's a huge crisis that's facing our schools right now. And then when you talk about technology, and you add technology into the mix, the way we talk about technology is ridiculous. It's just like, Ooh, man, like, look it, that's awesome. What am I going to do with that tomorrow? Look it is awesome. But that can't be the way we approach technology. Like, what instructional strategies does look it support to make those strategies more effective or efficient than they could be without this tool? That's how we have to have those conversations. So like, I like I love Nearpod. Nearpod and Pear Deck, I think are incredible tools. But the way we talk about them is ludicrous. It's like, oh, I love, I, I love Nearpod because it because uh, Nearpod owns Flocabulary, and kids think Flocabulary is fun. Forgive me, I don't give a flying shit if kids think flo Flocabulary is fun. Flocabulary works because Flocabulary is musical mnemonics, and musical mnemonics has an effect size of eight tenths, and you can find mus musical mnemonics embedded in Flocabulary, which exists in Nearpod. And then you can use some of the question and answer answer functionality in Nearpod because questioning and feedback both are highly effective instruct like that like that's that's sort of like the layered conversation I wish we were having around digital tools and instructional strategies. Does that does that make sense, Matt? It, yeah, it totally does. It does a hundred percent. And it's a conversation that I have been a part of in multiple perspectives, especially now as an instructional coach. Uh Conversations with teachers of they'll say to me, I, you know, I want to start using, well, just go with Nearpod. And my first question is, well, why are you using it? And a lot of times I might say, that's a great idea for an activity. You don't want to use Nearpod. You want to use this tool or you don't want to use technology at all. Um, I've had conversations with teachers uh, recently. Someone was looking at boom cards, which I had never heard of before. And the conversation boiled down to it gave immediate feedback to the students. It was difficult to use because we don't pay for it and 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 all that. And so I introduced multiple strategies where students could get immediate feedback, but it wasn't pretty and it didn't make noises. And so that was that was a setback for it. And it was yeah, as a coach, I just kind of had to stall my conversation there. But um, even on the administrative side, there's been many conversations of how do we improve scores? How do we improve student achievement? And we're always I feel like we're always looking for Band-Aid solutions Instruction. And I feel like the, an yes, the and answer I to that question is instruction. Sorry. How do I get? Yeah. No, because that's I, I keep saying we need a full time commitment of all district wide and building level professional development time to be dedicated to improving instructional practices and encouraging strong instructional strategies and the tools that we have available to to further emphasize those. I feel like a lot of times that conversation ends there. How do I get the conversation to not end there, especially with administrators? Oh, Ken, oh, your timing on this is so perfect, brother. So this, you, I, I feel your pain and I am in total agreement because the conversation does end there, right? It's like, oh man, like our, our, scores, are, our scores are not what we want them to be. How do we improve it? Instruction, that's the answer. And it, like, we have to improve instruction. It is the singular greatest need that exists in our schools right now. And so I'll tell you what I'm doing because quite frankly, like I, I got to the point where I was my own pet peeve. Uh, and one of my pet peeves, <laughs> one of my many is just like, 
people who are admirers of problems, like where we talk about these problems so much where we're not problem solvers anymore. Now we're just admirers of the problem. And I, I was just like, oh, damn it. Like I'm that person. Like I've talked about this so much. Now I'm just an admirer of the problem. And so uh, I'll tell you what I'm working on literally like from this office. And I've been working on it all month uh, is it, it is kind of aligned to a lot of my new work. It's essentially engagement in a year where it's 36 podcast episodes. They are all less than 10 minutes. Every single podcast is devoted to an instructional strategy. I'm talking PD in your pocket type stuff where it's like, hey, you want to know how to do a reciprocal teach? Here's how to do it. You want to know how to do a jigsaw? Here's what it looks like in the classroom. Here are the pitfalls that we usually fall into. Here's how to avoid those. And here's how to make it go. Right. And so like it's it's something that I'm going to be putting out into the world here in the next few weeks where it's just like, hey, like no excuses anymore. Like this is like the fact that I, I and, and it's funny because I feel the same way about this that I felt when I was writing Bold School. There were so many times I came out of my office and I was just telling my wife, I was like, Molly, this is so stupid. Why am I writing this book? This has to exist somewhere. This is just good teaching. This is just good practice, you know? And it, it was like, okay, well, I guess there was a, a need for this at the time. And so uh, again, like imagine, imagine what we could do for kids. Imagine what we could do for kids. If instead of walking into a classroom, where your teacher could name and describe at your accurately three or four instructional strategies. What if we doubled that number? What if it was eight? Think about what we could do for student achievement. Just like, and, and you're not talking about, I mean, come on, like 36 strategies. Okay. Pick four that, you know, and now add four to your repertoire and see what that does for student achievement over time. It'll move the needle. Like we, again, we know from John Hattie's work, like these are highly effective practices that move the needle for kids over time. Like, and that's, that's what I'm super passionate about right now. I, I love that. And I, I can't wait for that. And I think it, I think it helps in two ways because one, it, you're increasing your, your skill set of how to reach students. So you're going to be able to better differentiate. You're going to be able to better assess the students that you have in front of you and say, you know what, this is my favorite instructional strategy, but this isn't working with period five, right? If I'm a if I'm a secondary teacher, or this isn't working when I'm teaching reading if I'm a self-contained elementary teacher. But also the novelty piece, right? Kid, no matter how effective a strategy or a tool is, kids get sick of it. So if it's the if it if you only have three or four to rotate through, you're getting through those a lot. Whereas if you have a larger set of, of instructional strategies and tools to use, they're seeing it less and it just keeps your classroom more dynamic. And it adds joy to the classroom. Let's be honest, like we got to add more joy into the classroom for the adults who serve our children. And it's something we all need right now. Like there's frustration, there is fatigue. There's so many parts of our profession that just feel stagnant. And it's such, it's, it's so disheartening because like, when we feel fatigued and we feel stagnant and the instruction looks the same day after day, that's where things like scripted curriculums work their way into our classrooms. And I have yet to talk to a group of teachers in mass who are just like, yeah, scripted curriculums are awesome. They add tons of joy to my profession and they make me feel loved and valued. Like that's not a thing I'm hearing. It's, it's, it's because those things make us feel the opposite. It's like, okay, so let's be honest. Like, yes, this will improve student achievement over time, but also like, we got to figure out like, okay, let's bring some joy back to our profession. And this is not this. It, it's nobody's fault. You know what? That's, that's wrong. Uh, I don't know what the hell's going on in post-secondary education at colleges and universities. Uh, but I was not learning instructional strategies to take into the classroom. Uh, I could tell you about Pavlov's salivating dog, but I couldn't tell you how to do a jigsaw in my first year of teaching. Like that's educational malpractice in my opinion. Uh, but it's, this isn't teacher's fault and it's not principal's faults or superintendents. Like, it, like if, if you don't know it, you can't grow it. And so we're asking principals and assistant principals and coaches and superintendents to grow strategies that they don't know. And we all need to be okay to just exist and be learners in this space for a little bit. Well, I think that's uh, one of my, my gripes right now as a classroom teacher, I'm switching from fourth to fifth grade and I'm just looking at these manuals that tell me how to live life uh, for the next 180 days as I get acclimated to this new grade level. And we we had a guest just simply say that like, there's a science of education and science of teaching, and then there's an art of teaching. And I think that we have absolutely gone away from the art of teaching um, 
or it hasn't been valued like the science of teaching. And there's nothing wrong with data and there's nothing wrong. Ken is a big guy about data. He loves it. I could not care less about data, uh, to be honest. And um, what's, that's some of the beautiful things between us because mine is, you know, the vibe that sounds really academically valid, but, you know, the experience between my kids and I and, and what that is, the experience of the learning journey. And I don't necessarily care if I cover every academic standard and if I use every academic m moment as productively as I can, my kids grew tremendously, not because I hit all the check marks I needed to. And I think that's the beauty that we've had the experience of being two different people because Ken micromanages everything and just absolutely loves to, to dig into that. But all of that to say, you know, I feel like my pedagogy, pedagogical uh, awareness really was a freshman psychology course that told me about kids before I would even see them. And from that point, it was like, could I teach math? Could I teach science? And working with student teachers right now, they are trying their darndest. But it's like behavior management. They don't know what they don't know. And you only figure it out when you stumble into a problem where you have to figure it out. And it's a sink or swim. And too often, I feel like we're, we're sinking. Uh, a, a lot of our educators are. Yeah. And that can't be that can't be the nature of our profession anymore, where we just get tossed into the water. And you talked about like, you know, you talked about the vibe um, and you're like, oh, I forget what you said. Like, oh, that's an academic word. But just like we we can't nullify the vibe. We can't nullify the emo like learning is an inherently emotional experience, inherently emotional. It requires profound vulnerability. Uh, which, it, again, if you define vulnerability like Brene Brown defines it, un vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. We ask kids to enter into those places every single time they walk into a classroom. Uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Uh, and so, like, you can't separate, like, emotion from learning. Again, learning is an inherently emotional experience. Our most memorable experiences in life are times when we feel profoundly joyful or sad or angry. Like it's when we feel highly emotional. And so like, I, you know, I'm in hundred percent agreement. Teaching is equal part art and science. Teaching is equal part like architecture and interior design. And if you remove the design element and, and it, we're just, you know, creating boxes and checklists and it's just like, there's no, there's no joy in that. And because there's no joy, there's no emotional connectivity. And because there's no emotional connectivity, then there's no memorability. And now we're worse off than when we started. And we like, we got to get serious, like it, it, uh, about you know, sort of like the emotional element, because my all of my new conversations right now from the educators that was, was the book I most recently wrote are about engagement. And we got to think way differently about engagement and how we in, engage kids. Because for the longest time, we have counted on being able to tell kids like, hey, you need to work hard because you need what we're working on to go to college. And I'll tell you this, like kids don't buy our narrative anymore. I'll tell you, high school kids don't buy our narrative anymore. You know why? Because they've been paying attention. They have watched the previous graduates who came before them do exactly what we asked them to do. They have watched those kids work really hard, get good grades, go to college, come out with massive student loan debt, be unable to find jobs to pay off that debt and go back home to live with their parents. They have been watching so carefully and they don't buy into the notion, many of them, that education is the vehicle for upward mobility anymore. And we keep pressing that lever in hopes that it will elicit the same response on the back end. And that lever is broken. And so if we're going to consider like, hey, how do we engage kids? We have to start to connect their learning experience to emotion and positive emotions. If we're, if we're really serious about engagement and we're not just going to use it as a buzzword, uh, we, we got to be more specific about what that looks like. So I, I, I wanted to transition into that because engagement is a word, is a, I feel as though in education, a lot of times there are buzzwords that were built off of fluff and continue to be fluff. And then there are other ones that were built off of something really sound and then fluff comes with it as it becomes more and more popular. And I think engagement falls right into that. 
and you talked about experience and emotions. Can you paint the picture of maybe a specific activity or just speak more generally to the idea of how we can use some of these instructional strategies that you're talking about to invest our time into planning an experience for students where we really focus on what are the kids going to do? How are they going to, like you said, collaborate with each other, collaborate with the teacher and the content where almost all of our planning focus goes into that experience, but then on the back end, we get the same content result that we were hoping for if we just did basic direct instruction. Yeah. So in order, in order to do that, we have to understand what we even mean when we say the word engagement. Because Ken, you're 100% right. It's a word we throw around all the time. And too many people out there use the word engagement and fun as though they are synonyms. And they are not. Uh, engagement is not fun. Engagement is curiosity, participation, and the desire to persevere. When those three things are present, we know kids are engaged. When they are curious, when they are participating, and they have a desire to persevere, regardless of the level of rigor or difficulty in the task, we know that kids are engaged. That's what engagement is. Uh, it's way more complex than just fun. Now, the second thing we have to understand about engagement is that engagement is formulaic. Um, what's interesting is like, think about the places we seek out engagement in our lives, right? It's in the music that we listen to, the TV and the movies that we watch, the books that we read and the jokes and, we're, and the stories we're told. Uh, well, what we need to understand is like, all of those things follow really specific formulas for engagement. Every iconic song of the last century follows the exact same song, song structure, every single one. And I talk about this in, in my keynote. Uh, if you take a look, every Disney movie that's ever been, ever been done follows uh, Free Tags Pyramid, right? Every single one follows Free Tags Pyramid. If you're not familiar with it, you can Google it. Uh, uh, I'll tell you this, joke structure uh, uh, is oftentimes very, very similar. Like go watch a stand-up comedian, right? Uh, there is a setup. There is an assumption, a moment where the comedian will then shatter the assumption, and then bam, punchline. Every single joke follows pretty much pretty similarly that structure. Uh, think about it. Like Think about movies like uh, The Matrix and Harry Potter, uh, Spider-Man, Star Wars. Every single one of those movies follows the hero's journey, lockstep, because engagement is formulaic. And so our challenge is like, how do we engage? Like, what's, what's our hero's journey? What's our free text pyramid? What's our song structure? You know? Uh, folks tell us to be more engaging all the time. They're like, hey, you should be more engaging. And then we ask stupid questions like, well, how? And people are like, oh, hell, I don't know how, but you should be more of that thing, right? Just engage them. Uh, yeah, just, just engage them. Yeah, they use the same word back to us. And it, it, like, here's, here's like, again, I have observed thousands upon thousands of incredible teachers. Here's what engaging teachers do without knowing uh, they even do it. Uh, step number one, they, uh, I call it the ATLAS model. Uh, ATLAS is just an acronym for what engaging teachers do all the time. A-T-L-A-S. It stands for attention, transition, lesson, activity, and summation. All right. Great teachers walk in and they never begin by saying, good morning, class. Today we're going to insert boring thing here. You know why they don't start like that? Because that sucks. They understand the value of those first few moments and they capitalize on that primetime real estate for engagement to create curiosity. Step number one is attention. Step number two, they are masters of the transitional phrase. This is a phrase that is often repeated. It's your phrase that pays. Why? Because repetition has an eight-tenths effect size. What do you want remembered most, right? Then they teach a clear and concise lesson. And then the A, the second A stands for activity. The lesson is always followed by a doing thing. And then last but not least, the S stands for summation. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say summative assessment. I said summation. Why? Because the summation is about the emotional experience. Learning is sticky when it is tied to emotion. And the feeling kids feel when they walk in can't be boredom. And the feeling they feel when they walk out can't be failure. If those are the two prevailing emotions, they'll forget everything that happens in between. And so our challenge is to say like, okay, how do I capture and hold student attention? Use great transitional phrases. Repeat things that I want remembered. Teach a clear and concise lesson that is linked to a priority content standard. Provide an activity at the end of that lesson and then offer kids a summation before they walk out the door, right? That's, that's where engagement lives. And every single initiative that exists in our schools lives in this model, right? Engagement lives in the attention getter. Uh, uh, rigorous curriculum design and aligning to priority content standards lives in the lesson. I'll tell you what, 
Uh, every initiative we have around instruction and technology lives in the activity. This is where great instructional strategies live. This is where all these digital tool lives, uh, tools live. And all of our initiatives around so things like social emotional wellness live in the summation because we're holding ourselves accountable for what kids feel when they walk out of the classroom. We overcomplicate this thing so much. We add so much unnecessary, just like jargon and ridiculous, ridiculousness to it. It's just like, we need to be able to speak plainly and clearly about the work that we do so that we can replicate it. Oh, that was a big giant monologue. I'm sorry, fellas. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I love it. And, and it, I, I appreciate the formulaic approach because I, I do think that it needs to be simplified at times. And I was just... I was just reflecting on on the acronym and and the meaning behind it and thinking about my own teaching and when I felt I was most successful and I was least successful. And I can remember early in my career when I was being observed by everyone and their uncle trying to earn a contract and someone pointed out you didn't have closure. And at first I was like a little defensive like, well, I, you know, I ran out of time or this that and the other thing and I started reflecting on it and I started thinking about, well, closure if, if they're just completing a problem at the end, or I'm just saying, here's why we learned this. There's, there's no meaning to that. But when I started to think about what is the best way to close or end or, or um, complete the lesson, and I started crafting it and putting intention into it, I realized it was really meaningful. So it wasn't a, the fact of having a closure, it was having a closure of meaning or, or summation like, like you're putting. And I was thinking too, I, I taught a lot of small group instruction. My day was as a self-contained fifth grade teacher was almost always through small group instruction and student-centered learning. And my craft became much better when I started to think about that mini lesson when I was meeting with the kids and not just pulling groups, but designing that 15 minute lesson with intention. And so I was just trying to, to craft and, and evaluate it according to, according to, um, your acronym. And I just think it's, I think it's so important for teachers to think about that. And so the, the middle part of it is that direct instruction that you're talking about the lesson. Do you have any advice, but I noticed you said multiple times, clear and concise. Do you have advice for teachers who feel as though they spend way too much time on the L, but they, they, they're really good at direct instruction, but maybe needs to be streamlined or made more concise? Do you have advice on how to transition into that? Yeah. You know why we spend so much time on the L? Because the A is really hard. The activity is really hard, especially when you're operating from a strategic deficit. The A, like the activity, that second A is really easy when we have a catalog of instructional strategies to choose from, to say, hey, you know, like I, I'm a fan of direct instruction, but it, it, it has an effect size of nearly six tenths. It works. Like, I, I wish teachers would stop letting people who don't know our profession tell them that direct instruction is a bad strategy. Those people are wrong. You can tell them I said it. Uh, uh, but we have to ask ourselves, like, it can't be our only strategy, right? So, but again, clear and concise. You know, you have typically uh, for a, a lecture, explicit direct instruction, the lecture part of that, you've got typically the number of minutes as kids are years in age before they start to drift away. And that's really a maximum, Right. And so we have to ask ourselves like, okay, how do we shorten that? And then what are kids going to do with it? You know, after we uh, offer up a lecture, are kids going to do, uh, uh, are they going to watch an interactive video that goes with this? Because interactive video has an effect size greater than five tenths, right? Like, are they going to participate in a uh, teacher led discussion? Because discussion has an eight tenths effect size. Uh, are they going to uh, uh, create a concept map? Uh, aligned to the content that we just discussed? Uh, are they going to be taking some Cornell notes? Again, concept mapping, Cornell notes, like these are things that ex have existed for a long time. And sometimes like we shy away from them because they're not new and they're not sexy and they're not exciting and they're not of today. It doesn't matter. Like all that matters is that they work. And so the question has to constantly be like, okay, how do we shorten up the lesson part and then get to the activity? Like one of like one of the most frequently uh, said statements in schools around the country is like, ah, oh, I had a really good activity, but I ran out of time. Stop running out of time. It's the best part of what you are trying to do in the classroom. It's the part where kids can get their heads and hands around the content in ways uh, that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Like we, we have to drive to that moment. Do you get to the activity when you've thoroughly and effectively 
taught the skill or the content to a point where every student should just be able to successfully do the activity? No, does... no, no, no. Because if every student can do the activity successfully without you, then yeah, then you're done. Exactly, Matt. Then you're done. Right? Like we, we, we operate in this mindset of like, okay, now we're going to do the activity and every kid has to be successful at it. No, that's not, that's not the nature of learning. Learning is messy. Learning necessitates failure. And our schools have to be places where failure is expected. It, it, it is welcomed. It is okay. And there's no punitive, like we, we attach so many punitive metrics to failure. Like, no, it's like, okay, let's teach a chunk and let's do an activity and let's just get our hands on it and see how we do, you know? Yeah. Like that's, but you know, Ken, to your point, so often we, we try to make learning so clean and it's like, oh, if I just say this loud enough and long enough and repeat myself enough times, then by the time we get to the activity, everyone will do it. Well, then guess what? We don't need the activity. True story. So I, yeah, but you, I, you're ahead, really man. driving this point and I appreciate you being, uh, you know, full tilt, this action being the, the emphasis of where you're going, because I, I agree. It, it does strike me as the deficit. Do you feel like there are any conditions you would advise uh, any specific teachers based off any domain, whether it's uh, younger kids where maybe they can't do 36 different types of activities? Is it better to choose five or 10 to really diversify or, you know, maybe subject area or new teacher or not? What are some of your guidance as almost those baby steps to say, hey, I'm going to listen to your podcast series. I'm going to internalize all these ideas. How do I bring those back to the classroom? Yeah. So every, yeah, this is a, thank you, Matt. This is such a great question. Like, there is no way anyone should feel like, okay, now I got to go learn 36 instructional strategies. Like that's not, that's not. I mean, we're all playing bingo at home trying to, you know, get every, every piece in. Yeah. It's just like, here's, here's the thing that I try to like when I'm coaching teachers, like one of the, one of my favorite questions to ask is what's your superpower, you know? And it's one of those things like I would encourage all of your listeners to think about right now. Like if you're a classroom teacher and I ask you, what's your superpower? It should come to you like that. And if it doesn't, it means one of two things is true. It means uh, either you haven't thought enough about your practice or you're being too damn hard on yourself. And you have to discern which of those it is. And I love to ask that question because it's not about knowing 36 instructional strategies in the same way it's not about knowing every digital tool. It's about knowing what your superpower is and then finding the strategies and tools that amplify that. And so, uh, so I'll tell you this, I'll pull back the curtain on myself for a second. Ken, you can attest to this because you've seen me. Um, if you were to ask me what my superpower is, uh, you know what I would tell you? Storytelling. I love storytelling. It, it features prominently in the work that I uh, did with kids in the classroom. It features prominently in uh, the keynote work that I do. It features prominently in my writing. Why? Uh, because it's a thing I do pretty damn well, uh, and I enjoy it. It brings joy to my work. And so everything that I do is wrapped around storytelling. I love mnemonics because I can wrap mnemonics into storytelling. Uh, I'll tell you what, I love explicit direct instruction because it includes elements of storytelling. Uh, and so it's just like, Hey, I, I have uh, like, I have figured out like which instructional strategies and which digital tools support my superpowers. And then I've built around that because it's just what successful people do. I'll tell you one of the frustrating things that came from me, you guys, is like, you know, technology emerged and people tried to turn us all into sort of like flip learning and station rotation clones of one another. And there's no joy in that in the same way uh, that I talked about, you know, scripted curriculum, like there's not a lot of joy in that. And so every single one of us needs to figure out, okay, what's my superpower? And spoiler alert, it can't be relationships. That's too vague. Yep. Every, like everyone's superpower should be relationships. Sure. Like, you have to ask, yeah, you have to ask yourself really clearly, like, what is the thing pedagogically that like, where's the place where I shine? 
are you just like a monster at facilitating classroom discussion? Like, man, I in like people are like, oh, I can't get kids to talk. I'm great at getting kids to talk. Good, it's your superpower. Then you need to figure out where does Socratic seminar live? Where does feedback live? Where does great questioning live? Where does discussion live, right? Like those four instructional strategies. Oh, I'm a math teacher and I love to get kids solving complex problems. Well then guess what? Worked examples have to be a part of what you do. Problem solving teaching has to be a part of what you do, right? So like, again, starting to figure out like which instructional strategies best support uh, the work that you're doing and the work you do really well in the classroom. Yeah, so it's not it's not about all, it's about like the dirty little secret about really great classroom teachers is they don't have 36 strategies and 36 tools that they're choosing from. They got a handful of each and they are dominant at using each of those with fidelity. And I, I think it's really important to evaluate to, like you said, to know what to focus your time on, focus your energy on, and to design learning around and even evaluate what you're teaching, where you're teaching, right? If you're a yeah. secondary teacher and you are certified for English, you might evaluate your superpowers and say, you know, I moved to eighth grade, but I think my superpowers are best in sixth grade or, you know, for an elementary teacher, same thing, like your superpowers should match what you're teaching and who you're teaching. And if they're not, have that conversation with your administrators and say, down the line, when there's an opportunity, I really think I'd be best fit for this course or this class or these students, because these are this is what I do best. And that's where I can maximize the opportunity to, su to support those students. So when, when thinking about engagement and, and your acronym of, of ATLAS, and I'm trying to Let's just say I, I want to really focus on reducing the L and increasing the activity. How do I evaluate my success in in making that transition to to shorten that 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 front part and and give t students more time to experience the learning? Are there any look fors or things that I can reflect on as a teacher to evaluate that success? Yeah, I mean, students will give you immediate feedback in how you're doing. This is this is one of those things where it's just like. You know, I like the the crest of the wave analogy is one that I use often, right? Like imagine you're on the beach and you're seeing a wave, right? A wave gets to a point where it's reached its pinnacle, its apex, its absolute height. And once it gets to that point, there's only one thing that it can do, and that's tumble over and crash. Um, your classroom operates the exact same way. And so if you're in the midst of that, uh, uh, the L, you know, the direct instruction, the lesson, the lecture, whatever you want to call it, right? And you get to a point in your classroom uh, there, you're going to uh, arrive at a point where either it gets really, really quiet or it starts to get a little bit loud. That's immediate feedback from the kids that this has run its course, my friends. This is so funny because I work with uh, uh, preachers and priests and pastors and rabbis all the time too, right? So uh, they've started to uh, reach out to me for like homiletics consulting, like uh, the, the art of giving a homily. And it, one of the things I have to say to them all the time, and this will resonate with church going folks who are in your audience, is just like, I'm trying to ask them are like, I'm like, are you watching any of the people who are sitting in the pews when you're up there talking? Because I'll tell you what, there's a lot of folks who are sleeping and they're giving you feedback that, hey man, like your message has run its course. It's time to wrap it up. And so like the, the same is true for us in the classroom. Uh, only our kids are way less polite uh, about the messages that they give us. Yeah, absolutely. And just today, I was I was helping a teacher with their final project in in stat class, and I was there to help them, the kids with a couple of specific tools. And I was asking them, do they have any questions? And I just saw crickets. Like nobody, they're seniors. They're almost graduating. No one wants to participate. I said, great. I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay here for 15 minutes. If you have questions as you work with your partner, let me know. And I probably answered eight questions before I left. They just had no interest in participating as a class. They just wanted to do their work. But it was easy to entertain those questions as I, as I circulated the classroom. So, and that's great. And that's great use of their feedback to right. do exactly what they're asking you for with silence at the time. That's awesome. Right. Exactly. So I literally could continue this conversation all night, but I really want to be respectful of your time. So I want to transition into our exit ticket, which is the summation of every show that we have where we ask the same four questions to every guest every week. So Let's get it. Question number one, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? Believe with relentless tenacity in their ability to succeed. It's 
it's legitimately the best thing that we can do uh, in and amongst all the strategies and tools that we can use, uh, authentically believing that kids can be successful and making that belief visible to them. Because uh, if you think about the most influential teacher you had as a kid, um, it was it was those people. You know, um, relationships matter. Not a single one of us achieves anything without the benefit of an adult who, like I said, believes with relentless tenacity in our ability to be successful. I'm no different. Yeah, I love it. So uh, what's the best piece of advice that you've received? And it could have been from a colleague, maybe a supervisor or even a student. I've been asked this question a lot. This is a hard question, right? Because like, if you survive in this profession for any length of time, you get a lot of really great advice. Um, I'll, I'll give you one of the pieces. It's just one of those things that's resonated with me, especially as a high school teacher. Um, and maybe some of your folks need to hear it right now. Uh, I had a really great mentor teacher once upon a time tell me like, hey, never let a 16 year old determine your self-worth. Um, they're going to say and do things that are incongruent with what they actually believe and what they actually feel. And the hard truth is that as adults, like we take those things and a lot of times we internalize them and we tumble over them, uh, and we get caught up in them. And I had a really great mentor teacher and he told me one time, he's like, Hey, above all, just never let a 16 year old determine your self-worth, go home, spend time with your family, with people who you love and people who love you. Uh, that's where you derive uh, your self-worth from. Love it. Um, and that applies to 11 year olds too. So, totally. um, yeah, because yeah, 11 year olds are the most, I live with one. They're the most honest people on the planet. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we all recognize school year goes through waves and there are days, maybe weeks that we struggle to survive. What's something every educator needs to hear to help power up through those moments of struggle. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. What is something everyone needs to hear to power up through those moments of struggle? Shut it down, shut it down. There will always be more. Our, our, our profession is so important because we're, we're talking about our children here. Like these are our children. And at the same time, like I want us all to be able to do this job for a long time, not just a short time. And to do that, we have to be able to shut this work down. We have to be able to come home, close the lid, not think about email. Not, and, and so like, Every single one of us, and this is what this is a hard lesson that I had to learn because I'll I like I almost quit the profession three years in. I was like, I can't do this. Like it's too much, it's too hard. Um, but I had to figure out sort of like when my prime time hours were. And because I was the guy, I was first one in the building, I was last one out. I'm taking work home. There was always more, there was always more, there was always more. And again, finally had a really great mentor who was like, figure out when your good working hours are. And for me, it was always before school. And so I would arrive before school. I had keys to the building. I was keyed myself in and I would do my work a couple hours before the school day started. Uh, I would uh, teach the entire day. And then when the bell rang and it wasn't football season, I'm walking out the door with the kids because I, because I got to shut it down. Cause it's like, I, I just, I don't have it. I don't have it. And I got to go home and I got to exercise and I got to fill my buckets. Cause I'll tell you what, like you can't fill from an empty vessel. Uh, and I couldn't just keep burning the candle at both ends like I was. So I, I just, every single one of us needs to hear like, we're teachers are in such a powerful position right now. You know why? Because the job's hard as hell. And there's not tons of people who want to do it. So you know what? Set, like now's the time. Set some boundaries, please, for the love. Set some boundaries for yourself and be clear of those boundaries with your students and your parents. I was yes. very adamant with my, my parents um, in the beginning of the year. And I, I told them I arrived early. That was when I did my work. I was the same as you. And I also told them that I checked email at four o'clock when I left. And I only check email again at about six o'clock. I'll just jump on and just make sure. But even then, don't, don't expect it and don't expect a response. And I just said, if homework, if anything related to this classroom is a problem at home, stop. Just stop and email me and I'll address it in the morning. And so setting those boundaries, take email off your phone, take your LMS off your phone. It's just, it's just not necessary. It's just not necessary to be constantly connected because it is so easy to be constantly connected now for teachers. Absolutely. I, and, and, and I'll add one group of people with your administrative team. Be honest with them too. You don't get Sunday. You don't get Saturday. That belongs to my family. That belongs to my children. It belongs to my wife. And you don't get that time. And that's how it is okay for us to set those boundaries. Not only is it okay, like we have to normalize that in such a huge way. 
Absolutely. So I almost asked this question multiple times, especially when we were talking about instructional practices. So it's easy to fall into facilitating a repetitive classroom. What is it that you think separates teachers who are constantly seeking to change, innovate, and adopt new teaching strategies? Uh, joy versus survival in the profession, I think, right? Like teachers, teachers who still find joy in the profession are the ones who are constantly seeking to innovate. People who find joy in the kids, quite frankly, are the ones who are constantly seeking to innovate and try new things. Uh, I, I think, unfortunately, what has happened, and again, through no fault of their own, is uh, some of our colleagues and friends have sort of just settled into survival mode. They got in this profession like all of us did, and they discovered really quickly and really abruptly, like, holy hell, this is really hard. And they sort of like settled into a survival mode where it was like, hey, if I just do these three or four things, like I can get through the day, which will carry me through the week, which will get me through the month, month which will get me through the year. And those like those folks, I, I, I get so upset sometimes because so many times like those people get this label as like bad teachers. Uh, and what I find nine times out of 10 is that a lot of those folks are not bad teachers. You know what they are? They're afraid. They're afraid that if I try something new, it's going to be a disaster. And I'm going to feel that feeling like I felt when I was a first, second or third year teacher and I didn't know what I was doing and I hadn't figured out my survival tactics. Right. And so I, I, I just think that's the fundamental difference. And I think it's one of the reasons why we have to do the thing that we talked about, which is like, we got to restore some joy to our profession. We got to like open up a couple of these valves and alleviate some of the pressure that exists in our field right now, because it's just sucking all the joy uh, out of the work. And when there is no joy, people settle into survival mode and they just grind through the day. And that can't be the experience for us. And it can't be the experience for kids. Man, I feel... I feel it right now. I mean, I also have eight days left in the school year. So that yeah, might be a, con it, yeah, it might be a contributing it. factor. You yeah. know, Wesson, we've had guests on here um, that we've been privileged to talk to. And Ken talked about instructional strategies and methods with fluff. Uh, it is very clear that what you speak from is a devotion to this craft that you know a lot about, and there is no fluff. How can our audience uh, continue to follow along, whether it's a uh, reference to your books, uh, your upcoming very thrilling podcast series we're excited to hear about, or um, anything else going on in your world? Yeah, so uh, you can check me out on all the social medias. Find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, not all the social medias, all the ones that, you know, old people use. I'm not, I'm just not going to go down the TikTok and Snapchat road. I just can't. Um, you can uh, find uh, my wife and I on our podcast, Teaching Keating. Uh, uh, you can find me out on the road uh, doing all kinds of stuff and then be on the lookout for uh, the new podcast series. I'm going to put out Engagement in a Year, 36 Strategies for 36 Weeks. Uh, and again, don't try to learn all 36, like take the ones that most interest you uh, and that most add joy uh, to your classroom for both your, both yourself and your kids. Uh, start there and make sure you're uh, addressing the ones that support your superpower. Because uh, uh, I'll tell you what, that's, that's, that's where the secret sauce lives right there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We will link up to all of that in the show notes description, as well as our website at poweredu.com. Dot com will link to your your website. Teaching Keating is a great podcast. I've I've listened to that uh, for a while. It's it's fun and it Christmas, it breaks yeah. down the the instructional practices. Um, so definitely definitely check that one out as well. And I look forward to to the new one coming out as well. Weston, I I, I really can't thank you enough. This is not only like a, a fan grilling dream come true for me to have this time to talk to you, but it reminded me of why I why I enjoyed your keynote so much. Why I've read your books. And why I followed you because you clearly get instruction. And like Matt said, there's, there's no fluff. So I would encourage anyone to check out your books, check out your social media. And if you're, if you're ever involved in conversations where your district is talking about who can we have come keynote, who can we have come work with our teachers, you should absolutely throw, throw Weston's name into the, into the conversation at the, at the top of the list. So thank you again so much for joining us. And Matt, why don't you take us on out of here? Hey, thank you guys. Ken, Matt, really. Hey, sorry to interrupt. I just really appreciate both of you guys. Uh, the conversation was awesome. Uh, I can't believe we've been talking for as long as we have, but I've just so enjoyed it. So uh, thanks for letting me ramble on and just talk shop with you guys. Uh, thanks for all the uh, the good, uh, positive, stealing Matt's word again, the good positive vibes you just put out into the education space, man. We need it. Uh, we need folks like you just uh, uh, out there and 
uh, just uh, trying to do the not, not just the good work, but the very real work of not speaking at 30,000 feet, but just bringing it right down to the ground and making this all applicable. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Uh, thankful for the time. Honestly, I'm going to use that you're you're saying uh, the the clearance and validation of vibe. I'm going to use it against Ken for the rest of our podcast series. <laughs> so, but needless to say, without a doubt, you have left us feeling powered up as we power down this episode. Thank you for the time, everyone who's listening. Stay well, and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to or watching us on YouTube. Each week we get to talk to amazing educators who are making a positive impact on the lives of students, their colleagues, administrators, and education as a whole. It's been such a privilege every week to be able to talk to these incredible individuals, learn from them, grow with them, and better myself and all of education through these conversations. If you haven't already, please consider sharing this with a colleague, someone who can benefit and be powered up from the experience of listening to these incredible conversations. Because of Powered Up, we are powering education by empowering you.